National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Russia's strength in the Far East. Far East is a mighty outpost of Soviet power. We must strengthen it by all possible means. This was the Russian view in 1931. In this is a clue to the Russian strength, which today is concentrated in Soviet Asia. That great area between the Urals and the Pacific, which is larger than European Russia and the United States combined. A quarter of a century ago, Siberia was thought of as a snow-covered, ice-bound wilderness. Today it has been transformed, where the icy winds whistled and the wolves howled in the crisp air. Today there are roaring steel mills, rumbling mines, humming factories, air bases, naval bases, shipyards, vigorous new cities. Khabarovsk, Blagovestchensk, Komsomolsk. These are the cities of Soviet Asia. Nikolaevsk, Petropavlovsk. Sovietskaya. The names have become familiar in newspapers. Chita, Nerchinsk, Yarkutsk. Familiar in print, but only by putting them together, each as a piece in a jigsaw puzzle, is the picture of Soviet strength in the Far East revealed. North of the Amur River, flights of Russian planes maneuver overhead. South of the Amur River, Japanese watch these flights and try to estimate... Soviet Asia's probable total strength. By proportion to those bombers, what would be the strength of the Soviet ground forces here in the Far East? The true answer is locked behind the sealed borders of Siberia. And the clue is the Russian expression of 1931. The Far East is a mighty outpost of Soviet power. We must strengthen it by all possible means. The strengthening process started after the Soviets kicked the Japanese foot out of the Russian Far Eastern door in Vladivostok in the early 20s. Japan, along with the other allied nations, had sent an expeditionary force into Siberia at the close of World War I. When the allied forces withdrew, the Japanese refused to withdraw. The Soviets forced them out and then looked ahead. There can be no doubt of Japan's designs on Siberia. We must make Soviet Asia so strong that it can withstand any threat from Japan. That means that Siberia would have to be made completely self-sufficient. Not only from a military point of view, but also agriculturally and industrially. Can this be done without weakening European Russia? We will strengthen European Russia with the resources we have here in the Far East. Ah, shift our industry out here to the Far East. Exactly. Take our industry too, our raw materials. That will imply an enormous transportation system. We will build it. Linking the new industrial centers, one with another, and those in European Russia with those in Soviet Asia, a network of railroads and highways was constructed. To be strong, no part of Soviet Asia can be isolated from any other part. We must not only have industries to produce the tools of war and peace, we must not only develop regions to produce food, we must have transportation between them in order to organize a unit of strength. Observers looked down and speculated about what they saw. As far as I can make out, this new railroad is going to parallel the Trans-Siberian. Only it's going to be farther north. Oh, there's more to it than that. Well, of course, it goes through the gold fields of the Lena River in central Siberia. Oh, there are several military considerations in this new road. 
would never do to have it terminate in blood of a stock, the same place the Trans-Siberian terminates. Because of the possibility of being... by enemy action? Well, that could happen. That's why this new railroad, in all likelihood, will terminate several hundred miles north of Vladivostok. Where do you suppose that would be? Well, the Russians are saying very little about this new road at all. And they're likely to say much less about its eastern terminus. That railroad became known as the BAM, the Baikal Amur Magistral. It became a powerful factor in Siberia's strength, linking Lake Baikal with the Amur River, but not terminating on the Amur, where it might be endangered by the enemy. After the Japanese seized Manchuria and looked across the armor to Soviet Asia, the Russians knew well that it would be only a matter of time until there was a showdown between them. They strove to prepare themselves against this time. Cities rose out of the wilderness in the regions of Siberia where the resources were rich and along the routes of transportation. This is Petropavlovsk. Petropavlovsk is one of the most important Russian outposts in the Pacific. But why did they build a city like this all by itself on the bleak and isolated shores of the Kamchatka Peninsula? Observers pondered the reasons. The Russians were silent. But the Japanese knew. The waters in this vicinity are warm by the Japanese current. So Petropavlovsk gives the Russians an ice-free harbor all year round. The Japanese watched the development of Petropavlovsk. They have now put in a great floating dock. With this, the vessels of the Northern Sea Route fleet that are in need of repairs do not have to go into the ports on the Sea of Japan. Petropavlovsk can now accommodate the fleet all through the winter. That means that the Soviets now have greater patrol coverage in this area. On the Amur River, more than 200 miles from the Pacific, the Russians built another wonder city, Komsomolsk. Why did they build a new city at this point in the swampland at the edge of a forest? The Japanese knew the answer to this one, too. They built it at the junction point of the railroad and the Amur River. And there, they also built a steel mill. This steel goes out over the railroads to supply the armies and also goes into the vessels built in the shipyard. It soon became evident that Komsomolsk was a pivotal point of Soviet military strength in the Far East. And integrated in the same pattern of strength were other Siberian cities. Khabarovsk, where war material is produced for the Eastern armies. Chita, strategic junction point on the Trans-Siberian. Orsk, where meatpacking industries are located. Out of the wilderness, the cities rose. New cities. Cities created for a definite purpose, for a part of a great plan. Soviet Asia became a land of steel and stone, of tools and machinery, of scientists and skilled technicians and workmen, an industrial empire geared to military necessity. And in the great stretches of land between the cities, there were other developments. Wheat here in Siberia? Yes, that is wheat they are harvesting. Now, I was under the impression that nothing but rye could be raised up here in this northeastern section. The wheat you see out there, we developed to grow in this region. How could you do it? As most other things are done. By applying ourselves to the task that must be done. Uh -huh. And uh, are you satisfied with the results? We are no longer importers of wheat. Now we are exporters. Well, that's a remarkable development. We have also developed vegetables that will grow in the same way. Vegetables? As far north as this? Yes, and even north of here. You see, Soviet Asia must be able to feed herself. That was part of the plan, too. Food to feed the workers and the soldiers. Mines to supply the metals. Blast furnaces to smelt it. Industries to shape it into the implements of war and peace, and weapons for men. The Soviets are building a new and powerful autonomous army in Siberia. The Japanese knew this, and they knew one other thing. One of the important leaders of this new army is Marshal Vasily Bluka. Um, who is this mysterious military man who is organizing your forces here in Soviet Asia? Whom can you mean? Of this uh, Marshal Blucher. 
I know very little of him. Uh-huh. Well, what has he done? Uh, what is his background? No one seems to know, except, of course, that he was active during the time the Allies had their expeditionary forces in Vladivostok. An army was rising in the bleak regions of Siberia. But who was leading it and what its strength was, these were only half-real realities. But it was clear by the late 30s that soon there would be a showdown on the Manchurian-Siberian border. The Russians had grown used to seeing the Japanese across the border. Heavily armed patrols moved tensely within sight of each other. How heavily the Soviet patrols were armed, the Japanese were to learn. Lieutenant Kazanov, we are being attacked by the Japanese. How great is their strength? We are heavily outnumbered. Return their fire according to Plan B. Plan B, yes, sir. Return fire, Plan B. Return fire, Plan B. Corporal? Yes, sir. Notify headquarters at once that our patrol of 11 men is being attacked by superior numbers of Japanese troops. Yes, sir. Report that we are withstanding their attack. Yes, sir. The outbreak came on July 29, 1938, at Lake Kassan. Two days later, the Japanese renewed the attack at Changkufeng Hill, this time with more power and more zeal. Ranking Russian officers observed the attack. They were using airplanes and armored units. Apparently, they have planned this attack with the object of clearing the way for a march on Vladivostok. Mm, it may be. Just the probing for us to determine our strength at this point. It appears that it is an assault in force for this section. Huh. They have something to learn. Eleven days later, the Japanese asked for an armistice. The Soviets granted it. Not a single Japanese soldier was left on Soviet soil. And the Japanese crawled back to their side of the border to lick their wounds. Major Hirabare, why was your infantry battalion repulsed, sir? It was their tanks. Our reconnaissance did not reveal that they had tanks. Oh, they came up suddenly. Why did not you discover them before they counterattacked? They made use of rough terrain. We did not see them until just before they came to close quarters with us. Their firepower was terrific and very accurate. What of your firepower, Major Hirobari? It was not sufficiently effective against the Soviet tanks. Mm-hmm. That is all, Major. Lieutenant Kofuendo. Uh, yes, sir. Your unit suffered the heaviest losses, did it not, Lieutenant? Uh, yes, sir. We have a many dead and a many wounded. Why was this? They used all the types of arms, high-powered rifles and a right and a heavy machine gun. Are their weapons better than ours? They are very accurate. Their snipers camouflaged themselves so well, we could not see them. They held their fire until we came within a range. Their marksmanship was excellent. That is all. The up. incidents at Lake Kassan and Chankufang Hill echoed through the capitals of the Far East where the observers were keeping a close watch on Soviet-Japanese relations. The Japanese got more than they bargained for. The Russians gave them a first-class licking. <laughs> if you ask me, Japan's not as strong as she's given us to believe. It could mean that the Soviets are stronger than we think. Yeah, that could be the answer. If the reports are correct, the Soviet equipment, tanks and armored units and weapons of all kinds, are of the finest. Things coming out of those industrial centers beyond the border back there in Siberia. Yes. And it isn't cream puffs. What happened at Lake Kassan and Chankofeng Hill gave the high commands of nations all over the world an inkling of Soviet military power. It gave Japan more than that. Japan's eyes were opened. It was clear that Soviet Asia was indeed building up a strong military machine, an autonomous machine powerful enough to hold its own and more against any aggressor in the Pacific. Your aero sleds are 
very impressive, General. Thank you, sir. You see, they are like armored forts driven by propellers. Yes. They move across that snow almost as if they were flying on the surface of the ground. They can go where no unit with wheels can go. Hmm? What of their marksmanship while they're in motion? It is of the highest order. You see, the aero sleds maneuver very smoothly. Down over the snowbound terrain, the Soviet aero sleds came, their cannon barking, painted white. They were almost indiscernible against the snow-covered background. Ranking Soviet officers took note of their operation. There is the value of intensive training, that teamwork. Every unit has learned to work as part of the team. They have trained very hard. With their propellers whirring, the armored aero sleds roared over the rough terrain into the forest. Behind them thundered out a hundred almost invisible weapons of another kind. Ah, these are the ski tanks. Yes, sir. They can plow through the deepest snow or up over the roughest ice. Yes, I see they can. With their power-driven turrets, they have command in any direction. Snorting and rumbling, the powerful ski tanks drove across the terrain as if in attack. And following them swiftly, almost imperceptibly against the snow, came the white-clad ski troops. I hardly noticed them, any of them until I realized there were thousands out there before me. They move almost without noise. So, to have your machine guns and your mortars on skis, too. Yes, sir, and even our artillery. See it coming up in the rear? Along with the infantrymen and the artillerymen and their weapons came the engineers, the signalmen, the quartermasters. All the men needed for a complete unit of a fighting force. All dressed in winter white. All skilled ski troopers. They moved across the terrain in simulated attack and disappeared into the forest. And while they trained for the ground forces in the rough country, other young Soviets trained for the air force in Siberia's vast open stretches. A young Russian sits in the cockpit of a plane on the air base at Tashkent. They will give me the signal to take off in just a minute. Yes. You, um, you've just learned to fly, have you? Some time ago. I fly whenever I have the time. Will you do something else besides fly? Yes, I, I work in the industry here. In the industry? Oh, many of us who are workers have learned to fly in centers like these. Tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands. You work and you fly too? Yes, sir. We all belong to the Society for Assistance in Defense. I see. Looking to the future, eh? They must be ready. Well, tell me, what is this um, Society for Assistance in Defense? Well, as I said, hundreds of thousands of us belong to it. It is an organization with members in every part of Soviet Asia. Soviet Asia is a big place. They have members in the most isolated villages. They are all working for the same thing. I see. Well, tell me, how do you... Oh, sorry. This is my single to take off. Excuse me. Oh, sure, sure. While Russia girded for the conflict in the Far East, her mines and her mills and her men in European Russia were girding for the inevitable war there. From nothing, she had created a powerful independent military machine in Asia. And in 1941, though she was not yet in the war, the flames of the conflict had reached her borders in both the West and the East. On June 22, 1941, the blow fell. Hitler invades Russia. Hitler invades Russia. Hitler invades Russia. Hitler invades Russia. Hitler. The European-Russian front blazed into fury. And 5,000 miles to the east, the Siberian industries thundered with activity. Thundered through the days and through the nights. More coal and iron came out of the ground. More copper, zinc, oil, gas. More steel came out of the blast furnaces. More implements came out of the factories, weapons to fight the enemy, tools to till the soil, trucks and trains to transport the war supplies. How is the loading of these cars going? Oh, we have a double crew working on them. We are loading the supplies as fast as they are brought here. The loading must be completed by midnight. They are headed for Moscow. As soon as one train pulled out, an empty one took its place to be loaded and hurried off to Moscow. Rails 
sang a song of steel between the humming cities of Siberia. The intricate transportation system which the Soviets had worked so hard to perfect now sprang into high gear, and supplies rolled across the desolate miles from Soviet Asia to the Soviet European frontier. Now the great Soviet enterprise in the Far East began to pay dividends in European Russia, and not only supplies went. Well, hello there. Oh, hello, sir. I hardly recognize you in uniform. Uh, you're going to fly on the Western Front, are you? Yes, sir. Now all the training I have had will begin to count. Yes. Uh, are, are all these men with you from the base at Tashkent? No, sir. All of them are not flyers. They are troops of every kind. Infantrymen, tank men, artillery men, even parachute troops. They have been trained in many places in Soviet Asia. Well, you're a vigorous-looking lot. All Thank right, you. hurry it up, all aboard! Well, goodbye, sir. Goodbye to you, and good luck. Trains pulled out day and night. Trains loaded with men, with war material, with medical supplies, with food. No nation knew how much supplies or how many men were shipped from the Far East to the Western Front, but all wondered if enough was sent to weaken Soviet Asia. Most of all, Japan wondered. But even as the great shipments were going on, the Soviets were continuing the building of their military strength on the Pacific. The charge is set and ready, sir. Very well. Give the warning. Stand clear back there. Stand clear. <laughs> set off the blast. Yes, sir. It will take one more blast here. Will we have time before dawn? It is almost daylight now, sir. We must finish before dawn. But the ground is frozen hard. We cannot dig into it to set the charge. Shoot through the ice with your rifles. Right down alongside the hill. Yes, sir. Stand clear over there. Did you make a hole big enough? Yes, sir. Hear it? You see? Yes. Now plant your sticks of dynamite there and tamp them down. Yes, sir. Throughout the night, the crews worked, excavating with dynamite where they could not excavate with machines. And into the excavations went structural steel and numberless tons of cement. And while the construction of these military installations went on at the most strategic points in the vast spaces of Siberia, thousands of miles away, back in Moscow, important decisions were made concerning Soviet Asia. As of today, Soviet Asia will be divided into two military commands. A finger went down on the great detailed map of Siberia. The Trans-Baikal Front will have its headquarters here at Chita. Chita is a junction point on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, 1,000 miles inland from the Pacific. A city believed by the Soviets to be the possible objective of Japanese attack. And here at Khabarovsk, the Far Eastern Front will have its headquarters. Khabarovsk, the factory center, 500 miles from the mouth of the Amur. The Far Eastern Front will be under the command of General Joseph Apansenko. Nearest to the Japanese holdings was the command of General Apansenko, and the Japanese knew him well. No love lost between him and the Japanese. They understood his language of talking with deeds rather than with words, and nothing he did was lost upon them. Ostensibly, the parade was for the purpose of observing the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. However, General Aponosenko, with his genius for demonstration, possibly ordered the parade of tanks and mechanized equipment through the streets of Khabarovsk for the purpose of impressing personalities who were not even present, at least not personally. The parade was actually the first public showing of many of the newly developed armor units of the Soviet Far East Army. They ground through the streets while tens of thousands of smiling Russians cheered them. Foreigners in the crowd merely appraised the passing units. Yes, sir, it's a detailed report of the equipment in the parade. Mm-hmm. As many heavy units as light ones. It was, in effect, a cross-section of the Soviet armored mechanized equipment. Many people saw the parade? Oh, many thousands, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Could it be that this parade was a demonstration for us rather than for those who watched it? Uh, I do not know, sir. Did... 
Did anyone see General Aponosenko? No one, sir. He is a daring and dangerous man. He is afraid of nothing. And we have reports that he personally has sabered more than 200 men. The Japanese had more to watch than Aponosenko. While the Soviet Asia war plants hummed day and night turning out this war material, which they knew was earmarked for use against them, other events were taking place on the bleak coast of the Kamchatka Peninsula above them. How, how do you say the name of this port? Petropavlovsk. It is not hard to say. Oh, not for you. Petropavlovsk. That is right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what happens to all these supplies you brought in this car? It has a long trip from here. We reload it. Then we take it down across the Arktotsk Sea to Sakhalin. The island Sakhalin, you know. Yeah, the island right above Japan. That is right. From where we landed, it goes overland, over Sakhalin, and then across the ice of the Straits of Tatari. Right over the sea? The ice is very thick there. And from there, it goes on to Kamsomolsk. Kamsomolsk. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's that junction point of the railroad in the Amur River. I've been there. Yes? Yeah. And from there, over the railroad and up the water systems, the material goes to its destination in Soviet Asia. And far above Petropavlovsk, across the Bering Straits, there was the almost incessant drones of powerful motors. Well, I guess your flight takes off next, eh, Igor? Yes, sir. It is a wonderful airport you have here. Yeah. Just built since the war. It was too cold up in Alaska for me. You just fly the planes up here to Alaska? Yeah. My home's down in Alabama. Alabama? Yeah, that's way down in the south. Where are you from? My home is near Tashkent in Soviet Asia. But I am like you. I fly everywhere. Well, we brought you guys some hot ships to fly across to Russia. Yes, we know. We are going to take off here tonight because we understand that another convoy is coming in at dawn to go across tomorrow. Convoys of planes heading across the Bering Strait and disappearing into the fastness of Soviet Asia. And the drone of these planes echoed in the ears of the Japanese. What figures do we now have on the strength of the Soviet Asia air power? We have no reliable information. Why? So many conflicting reports come out that there is no accurate way to evaluate them. One reporter says that their air strength was greater in 1939 than in 1947. Naturally. We have no other dependable information. We know that she has built an entirely independent air force here in the Far East. Yes. And we know that she has developed air bases at a half a dozen Siberian cities. But there is no dependable information. Then we must get it. Yes, sir. The Soviet armies in the Northeast outnumber us at least three to one. This we know. She has concentrated on submarines and torpedo boats. This we know. We have charts of her minefields and coastal artillery. But our air force is... Is it possible that our information on her army, her submarines, and her coastal artillery could be as a 40 as our information on our Soviet Asia's Air strength. Yes. It could be possible. You have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. To repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.